Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but perhaps for yours. And of course, I'm just kidding. The model that I'm going to cover uh, today is part of my subset in this series of models and methods of impact. And today we're going to focus on my management of areas of performance model or framework. This model is my version of something that uh, is based on the work that I did with my former uh, business partners, my two business partners, the late Ray Svensson and my former wife Karen Wallace uh, as we worked on our book, our 1994 book, The Quality Roadmap. Um, and uh, this is partially comes from work that Ray Svensson had done back at AT&T um, before he went out on his own as a consultant and uh, we created this model, the, the broader model that I've adapted to my own uses and my own uh, relabeling and, and language to a bit, uh, was based on management analyses that we had conducted as primarily an instructional systems design consulting firm. We were a small firm in western suburbs of Chicago, but we had done just over 20 management analyses uh, they were all targeted at curriculum architecture designs for management populations. And so we had uh, this 20 some sets of analysis data. And so we took a week off and spent that entire week in our conference room sorting through all the data, trying to come up with a mastery model, if you will, a starter model, um, so that we could shortcut and, and quicken our analysis efforts when we're studying management populations. And I saw this as an opportunity to broaden this, to look beyond just managers, but I could look at just managers, but I could also look at the organizational entity of a team or a department or a function or a division or a strategic business unit or the entire enterprise. So my intent was to be able to create a framework that I could use with my clients on mostly on future curriculum architecture design efforts uh, to study well what are the performance requirements of managers and again we if we wanted to broaden this out and look at you know what's the performance requirements of a department you know sales or finance or marketing we could use this model here and systematically tease out all of the task sets and the outputs that result and identify the measures for both etc and then look at what are the enabling knowledge and skills and what became apparent to me before I created my model was that I can frame this model in such a way that I can identify things that are shared across the entire enterprise such as the annual budgeting process you know everybody's got to adhere conform to that process it's owned by one organization but all the other organizations must use it and so there's a lot of that I had seen uh, in my management analyses efforts over the years. Again, this was all done probably in the early 90s. Again, it was part of the 94 books. So it was probably done in 92 and 93 after I'd been uh, working with Ray and, and my uh, former wife, Karen, uh, for 10 years. And so we had a lot of experience doing this, but, but I wanted to have a model that allowed me to identify what things were highly shareable, shareable as is, or with only slight modification uh, from both, you know, what are the processes people must perform within, what are the knowledge and skills that they need, what are the training or job aids that they might uh, be able to take use of, and so what things are really shareable. And I wanted also to be able to really pin down easily, more easily, what is unique, one department, if you will, to the next. So what makes sales different than marketing, than HR or training or recruiting and selection, et cetera? And those things I've labeled core uh, in this model, but the things that are labeled leadership and support are things that are highly shareable, if not completely shareable across the entire enterprise. 
I had seen you know way too many instances of clients having training content uh, created you know over time by you know the training organization or the departments themselves, uh, and they created tremendous overlap. They created redundant content when it wasn't necessary, but it was simply because. You know, back in the day, we didn't have easy access to centralized repositories that everybody could tap into and share and participate and take from so that they could, you know, reuse it, you know, as is or perhaps with minor modifications. So that was the intent of the model. So again, the, the model has three levels or four levels, depending on how you want to look at it. And, you know, I really don't care. Um, there's the leadership tier in the model at the top. And these are things that, you know, are part of what an organization does to lead the enterprise, the division, the function, the department, the team, uh, depending on how teams are actually used in organizations. So that may not be a, a good example to use. But uh, at the department level, there's a lot of things that departments share across that I could consider leadership and people may quibble with that and then they can move the boxes around if they need to. The next tier in this framework is core. These are uh, the things that make management's job or the f department's jobs different. So sales is different than a training organization because they're doing sales stuff and the training organization is doing training or instructional or learning stuff. And uh, but so the, the, the one thing that is common across that is that managers are planning work, assigning work, monitoring work, and troubleshooting work. But the work itself that they are doing those things on varies. It's different, uniquely different. And I, we have many clients who've wanted us in the past to, you know, develop all the training that are shareable across management populations. And some of them wanted to also look at the things that made those organizations unique. Well, that's the intent of this model, is to be able to jumpstart that entire process. And I've used this model on probably five or six uh, projects um, uh, since those early 90, uh, 90s when we did this. The third level or tier um, is are the things that managers do that support their organization at the department level, function level, you know, on and on up to the enterprise level. And uh, so we'll, we'll come back and look at uh, all of what these boxes are because you can't read them in this uh, graphic that I've got posted alongside of me. Um, but so those are the three primary levels. And then there's a fourth level at the bottom of this graphic here are the processes themselves. You know, in the training organization, we have an addy like process. We have a delivery deployment kind of a process. We have a uh, perhaps an intake process. Perhaps we train and develop coaches. We do train the trainer. Those are all distinct processes. And of course, there's a lot of enabling knowledge and skills that cross over many of those, all of them, etc. Um, but so this could be considered to be the fourth tier, if you will. And this is again the, the focus of you know what makes one organizational entity different from the next. Uh, so that their unique performance requirements can translate into unique, perhaps, knowledge and skill requirements, although you probably use, you know, word processing across every last one of these things and maybe spreadsheets and PowerPoint and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the thing at the bottom of the model here, there's, there's two colors there, green and light blue, and those are to indicate the things that are either owned by the department, it's our process, and perhaps we alone participate in our own process, um, or perhaps others participate in that process, but we own it. And the other type of process that's indicated here are processes that are owned by other organizational entities that the people in the Department of Focus, their people, participate in somebody else's process. It's like engineers supporting the sales effort. They report back into the engineering organization, perhaps, but they're out there supporting sales. Well, sales owns that process. They're the ones who dictate, you know, what's that process look like? What are the tasks? What are the outputs? How do we frame it? How do we articulate it? What do we, how do we label everything? So we need to recognize that too, because if we're looking at engineers and they're working on their own internal processes, well, that's one thing, but if they are supporting other people's processes, perhaps there are new knowledge and skills that they need to be able to be more successful, uh, have greater productivity 
when they're supporting other organizations processes so that's the intent of the model um, if we can here um, let's begin to look now at uh, each one of these uh, tiers if you will um, layers or tiers um, so back at the top again there are uh, six boxes across that and uh, I'll read them here they are stakeholder relationship management the next one is strategic planning and management followed by operations planning and management then results measurement planning and measurement then process improvement planning and measurement and communications planning and management and I'll come back to talk a little bit about each one of those, but I'm going to give you the big advanced organizer, uh, you know, version two, uh, my second pass at this after the first one. So these areas of performance are more typically the responsibilities of middle and upper management. You know, upper management, middle management are doing strategic planning for the organization. You know, first line supervisors most often are not involved in that. They may be asked for their input, but they're not in the process of making discriminations and decisions and doing the actual planning and producing the plans. But they're going to implement the plans, most likely. But, uh, but so they don't really own it, but they're going to be impacted by it. Um, so covering those now at this next level here so stakeholder relationship management is really all about do we understand who all of our stakeholders are i mean we have our shareholders that's typically the most obvious but we have executive management and middle management and and first line management and supervision we have the employees themselves we have suppliers we have customers we have the communities in which we operate there's society at large so there's many different ways to look at who are the stakeholders and what are their requirements and what are their desires because they may have desires beyond requirements and minimally we need to meet the requirements but we might need to understand their desires so that we can do better than just meeting their requirements or if it's a competitive situation say with customers we need to exceed their requirements in a competitive situation if if that makes business sense it doesn't always do it but we need to be cognizant of you know what are their desires beyond their absolute minimum requirements because maybe that'll differentiate us in their minds and they'll will become their supplier and they'll be our customer anyway so we need to understand so what do they expect from us and how well are we doing at meeting their expectations um, and if we're not hmm you know, then we have something that we need to attend to most likely uh, push comes to shove uh, depending on the stakes involved you know if we're not meeting them on nickel and dime stuff we might ignore that but if we're missing the boat on million dollar kinds of things then we probably need to attend to that if it's if it has that kind of a stake a risk or a reward to us then we probably need to step up to that and that most logically leads into so what's our strategic plan and then we need to manage to that strategic plan so if we understand the stakeholder requirements that takes us into the next box strategic planning and management so when we do strategic planning and management we need to be considering many many different things one key in my mind is so what do the stakeholders think about how we're doing so far already what are their future needs how are we going to meet those needs if one of the stakeholders are the regulators you know where are the regulators going and are we strategically planning to be able to meet those requirements or are we going to be surprised by that and then have to scramble at the last minute and try to uh, conform um, the next level the next box in this top tier is operations planning and management so once we understand what the stakeholders require and what our strategies are to deal with those things, here is tactically how are we going to do it so we do operations planning and management. And within that is usually creating our budgets and such. Um, so we need to have you know long-term and short-term operational planning goals that tie back into the strategic planning goals, which again reflect the needs of our various stakeholders. 
The next box then, the fourth box, is results, measurement, and planning. So we've got, you know, we put all that in place. We're doing our operations planning. We've got goals and everything that help us align with the strategies and tactics that align with the stakeholder requirements. You see how this all ties together. Um, now we better measure how well we're doing against that. Otherwise, we're simply going to put a lot of things in motion but not know how well we're doing against our own desires or requirements. Um, if we have to, if we've been given a certain amount of uh, 90 days to put something in place by the uh, regulators or they're going to shut us down, we better be tracking on more than a quarterly basis how well we're doing against uh, putting that in place. What is our implementation plan and schedule and how well are we doing on that? Are we going to miss that? Do we need to put more resources on that? Do we need to go to the regulators and beg for more time? Et cetera, et cetera. So results measurement and planning is a key leadership function, major duty, accomplishment, key results area, something that Guy calls areas of performance. The next box is process improvement, planning and management, because of course if we put apply measures to our situation and find out where we're doing okay and where we're not doing so okay, we might need to do some process improvement and if we need to improve our productivity, our effectiveness, our efficiency, our costs, our schedule, uh, ability to deliver on on schedule then we better put in some process improvement efforts and again this all ties together hopefully you can see that the last box at this tier is communications planning and management which I believe is a leadership function uh, the top of an enterprise needs to have command and control of how are we communicating, who are we communicating to, what were their needs for communication, and are we meeting those needs? Again, circling back to the stakeholders, what do customers require, what do suppliers require, what do our employees and their families at home require, what does the community at large require, um, and what are we communicating with the uh, shareholders, you know, beyond the annual report, are we communicating with these constituencies that we need to serve? and that are part of our ability to serve other stakeholders. So, you know, what routine communications are we gonna put in place? Uh, what do we do in emergencies? You know, the factory catches on fire. Who's gonna speak to the public, to the news organizations, uh, to the investigators? You know, we can't just have anybody doing that. We need to have that in somewhat tighter control uh, to control the message to make sure people don't misspeak because they have the wrong understanding of something. You know, it's not always nefarious for why we only have certain people speak to the press um, because that's, those are high stakes situations normally. So there's, again, there's routine communications and then there's communications on demand, which are usually some sort of an emergency or special situation uh, that comes up. The next model. Uh, the next tier in this hierarchy then are the core areas of performance. Again, major duties, accomplishment, key results areas. Lots of different language for this. And what I found over the years is that all of those other labels have nuanced meanings to some people, not necessarily everybody. And to avoid that and avoid, you know, tripping into, well, guy, that's not what that means and that's not how that's used, I decided to forego those kinds of conversations, having had them a few times. And I just label everything as an area of performance. And what, what that means is that there's a whole bunch of outputs and task sets within that box, that area of performance. And, and that's one of the ways that we can, you know, do complex analysis and try not to miss anything because we can frame it at a high level and then go after it. It's like looking at ADDIE versus just saying, you know, instructional design. You know, even if you don't like the ADDIE model and I don't myself and I don't use it, I have a, an, an alternative version of that, similar but different. But at the core level here, again, uh, as I said earlier, there's the things that the uh, management is doing, if this is a management area of performance versus the departmental, but the managers in a department are planning work and assigning work, monitoring work, and troubleshooting work. And depending on that work is, you know, is it happening, you know, outside my door uh, on the uh, uh, floor here, on the office floor, or is it happen remotely, or is it a combination of all that? How I plan the work 
and, mon and assign it and monitor it and troubleshoot it may vary depending on the specifics of the work that I'm looking at. You know, not everything can be done as via Gemba walks, walking around and seeing the operations. You know, in a factory that's fine, but if you have a distributed remote workforce all coming together to do their work, you can't walk around and look at that. So the whole notion of, you know, management by walking around, uh, which is a good idea, and you may need to do that virtually and you know or over the phone or through text messages or whatever but checking in with your people to see how things are going but that's all done a little bit differently again depending on whether it's sales work or or training design development delivery kinds of work or whether it's the financial organization going out there and auditing the suppliers or the quality organization going out and auditing the suppliers or the finance organization going out and auditing possible suppliers vendors to our organization because you know we don't want to do deals with people that are about ready to go bankrupt um, so these areas of performance are more typically the responsibilities of middle management and first-line supervisors uh, probably at the executive level you know the senior vice presidents aren't turning to the vice presidents and saying I've planned your work I'm assigning it to you I'm monitoring it to you and I'm troubleshooting you know they are doing those things but not at a kind of a granular level that you might expect at the first line of supervision. You know, it's one thing to say that, uh, you know, we should trust our employees and, you know, not tell them what to do. Well, I think that notion is silly. We need to tell them what to do. We may not need to tell them how to do it, unless, of course, there's regulations or best practices or good practices or Six Sigma processes and practices and we need people to pretty much adhere to those things otherwise they're going to negatively affect the quality, the quantity, the costs of the products and services that we render to the marketplace or that we render to internally you know are if somebody is messing up the uh, performance review and then the salary compensation adjustment kinds of things because they're not adhering to our process they've created their own well, that might cause a lawsuit later on, and of course, that's no good. Um, so the planning of the work is, you know, pretty simple. You know, so you need to take a look at uh, whether you're planning work on a daily basis, a weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis, and then assigning that. Whether you're assigning that for work that needs to be done right now or in the next quarter, guy, you're going to need to be doing this kind of a project and that kind of a project. And I thought I'd just give you a heads up. So there's all of that. Again, this, this can vary tremendously based on the type of work there is. And then there's assigning the work. Um, and this might be, you know, somebody assigning guy his standard work and what the next project is with the next client. Or it might be, guy, we're going to try to groom you to go from being a designer to being an analyst. So we're going to start giving you some analysis work to do. Uh, maybe you're going to do that initially with with somebody else and co-do it with them and learn from them and then you're going to do it on their own and they're going to watch you or again there's many ways of doing this but when we assign the work we often just not to need to hand out assignments we need to explain what the assignment is all about what's key and critical about it uh, unless this is just more standard work and it's the same old same old same old with you know maybe a new customer or a new day or or whatever but but so that so this again varies depending on the nature of the work that needs to be assigned then monitoring the work you know we can teach supervisors you know basic theories rules uh, practices that they might employ to monitor work you know don't be a micromanager you know manage from a distance first look at the outputs and then if you got problems with that then go look at the tasks and the process and the practices that people are employing as they try to produce those outputs um, but again monitoring work depends on the nature of the work and you know when is it you know easy or appropriate to go and do the monitoring is it when the dust is settled and it's all over with or is that too late or does it depend on, well, this is the first time guy's done this, so we need to look at it much more closely, but if we're giving this to uh, Susie or Jamel, you know, we, need, we can wait till they're done. And we can wait till the last second before they're ready to turn in the output. We might want to take a look at it before they turn that output over to its customer. So again, varies depending on the amount of the type of work. Troubleshooting work, again, depends on the type of work that it is, and so that may be unique, and we may not be able to have a training course on, you know, troubleshooting work, as if it's all the same. It isn't. Again, the core area are the things that are unique 
to the department. So if we're looking at this from a managerial standpoint, well, the manager's job is a little bit different when we get into this central center tier um, and or the work of the individual contributors in that department, that varies too. Um, because this is a different than, you know, them all participating in some sort of a, a operational planning and budgeting kind of a process or a process improvement project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now we can again look at the, the, the core areas of performance, the actual work of the department, that, that all that planning and assigning and monitoring and troubleshooting is all about. Um, and so the key thing here is that uh, too often I've seen this when we go in and analyze an organization or a management's job and we don't understand that they are responsible for managing sometimes their people who are working in other organizations processes and they need to of course get feedback from that other organization as to how well guy did over there when he was working and supporting you uh, so that i can reflect that in his performance reviews and hold him accountable and give him credit or blame uh, when things go well or not so well based on his performance and so we just need to recognize that that the individual contributors in an organization work on processes, work in processes that their organization owns, but sometimes they're loaned out. And sometimes that's not so obvious, it's just the way it is, and we don't often think about that. But we may need to establish some sort of a communication with the managers or the participants in the other processes so we can check and see how well is Guy doing. Um, because that goes to planning that work if guys if I got a loan guy out 25% of his time I can't load him up with 100% of the work in our department and expect him to do the other 20 another 25% uh, because we're gonna I'm gonna burn him out or I'm gonna force him to leave and go seek happiness elsewhere um, and so you know how well we want to do that we can hold our managers accountable for that at the bottom, at the final tier here, are the support processes, uh, these boxes are the process design and redesign. So if there was an improvement process project assigned from the top leadership tier, at the support level, somebody's actually got to implement that. So it's one thing to plan and manage a process improvement, but somebody's got to actually do the work, and so this is where that happens. An individual contribute, you know, so it might be a cross functional improvement effort, or it might be something, you know, inside HR and in the recruiting and selection area, and we want them to improve their process. You know, we can zoom in on that, but who's going to be responsible for implementing that? Well, most likely the supervisors, the managers, and the individual contributors of the uh, departments, if you will, that are involved in all of that. But if it was recruiting and selection, it might be recruiting and selection standards and processes are out of whack. And when people in the other departments go to implement them, it's a mess and it's not producing the kind of quality candidates uh, and new hires that we're looking for. So we may need to go fix that. So even though some of these processes touch other organizations, they don't own them. And we don't expect them to uh, redesign them we might ask them for their input and their feedback to our redesign efforts before and after we do the redesign or in the middle of us doing the redesign. Um, but anyway, so that's that's this lower tier. Uh, the next box here is a huge one uh, when you look at this. It's human asset management. So this requires, uh, in my models, uh, you know, organization design and job design. You know, do we need to take a couple of these jobs here and split them in two because our volume is so has grown and these people used to be able to handle this and maybe the smart thing to do is to just not add another person in there and they're all doing the same maybe it's to take people who are in more generalist roles and move them into more specialist roles and cross train them so that they can move back and forth as volumes of the work change and of course that's the job of managers at the lower levels looking at the work volumes, the type of work and the work volumes at their level of the organization and deciding how they're going to get it done. With a bunch of specialists handing it off to each other or a generalist and one person taking something through. You know, in the instruction design business, should one person be the 
business relationship manager, the project planner and manager, the analyst, the designer, the developer, and then go deliver it and then measure all that work? Should we have just one person, you know, one riot, one ranger, as my one of my clients used to say, and we're going to have one person do that end to end? Or are we going to have different people doing the business relationship management with our customers? and maybe a set different person doing the project planning and management and maybe specialists doing analysis and specialists doing design and specialists doing development and within development some people are writing text and other people are producing videos and and ar and vr kinds of uh, uh outputs you know is it, is it really one riot one ranger or do we need people wearing specialty hats so they can get really really good at that because it might be quite impossible impractical to expect one person to wear all of these hats um, and so those are business decisions in terms of how do we configure and sort out the work um, so that was just one part of the human assets management that was just you know organizing and designing you know what's 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 the organization design here is my department got two sub departments in it or just one big department you know how do i how do i begin to look at that and how do i uh organize the jobs design the jobs so that they are uh done being done smartly and with some flexibility you know that usually involves that cross training thing um, and then I need to go affect uh, the succession planning. So where are we going to get our staff in the future? Uh, I need to affect perhaps the uh, recruiting and selection. Somebody else may own it, but I'm going to be a participant in that. So uh, again, these are things that are shareable. Those things might be owned by somebody else, the recruiting and selection department, so to speak. Um, but other managers are doing the recruiting and selecting unless they're just taking candidates that are handed to them. Again, it varies. And so how do you tease that out? How do you begin to figure out how does that work here? Well, this model allows you to focus in on that and figure that out one client situation to the next. Um, so after we've uh, figured out what our succession planning is, what our staffing and recruiting, uh, our uh, selection and recruiting systems are, how are we going to handle the training and development, which includes onboarding and ongoing development, how are we going to do performance appraisal and performance management, how are we going to admit uh, compensation and benefits, how are we going to do recognition and rewards. Those are all things under this box here of human asset management. So it's a huge one with lots of different responsibilities in there dealing with the human factor, the human factors within our business processes. The next box here is environmental asset management. So you just don't have people and, you know, what they need is they need the data and information to do their jobs. And that might be, you know, work orders, work instructions, et cetera. Uh, information, you know, there's static information, you know, good for a long time. There's dynamic information, changes all the time. So you need to, you know, figure out, you know, what, are, what is the cost of money today? If I'm going to do a business plan and I need to you know, figure out how much money I'm going to need for the corporation, there's a cost to that money, so that changes all of the time. But how I calculate ROI might be the same and not change much, if at all, or ever. And so there's that kind of data and information. So I've had many clients who've calculated ROI differently, one to the next, and they have their own way. And they're, they often don't change that because they're trying to figure out, you know, out of all my opportunities to spe invest money for returns, I got to take a look at projects and I've got to normalize how we're looking at that so people don't play games with, you know, well, the cost of money is 1% for me and somebody else was more realistic in saying 6% or whatever a realistic number is. Um, we need to normalize that and make that easier for uh, managers. So again, within the box there is data and information. There's materials and supplies. You know, you know the individual contributors out there with all the right stuff that they need. Their awareness, knowledge, and skills, physical capabilities, intellectual capabilities, psychological capabilities, and values. They need all the rest of this environmental stuff. So materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds. You know, can I do? Do I have to have a, a temperature and humidity controlled space to do this work? Do we have that? If we're going to have a customer showroom, do we have adequate parking for customers or do we make them angry before they even walk in the door because we made them park across the street because we don't have adequate parking for them? I mean, 
Some of this might sound silly, but depending on the nature of your work, you might need a bigger parking lot for your just your customers alone so they can come in and park close to the door, etc., etc. And, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and beyond that, there's, there's additional environmental factors such as uh, do you have the finances, the headcount and finances, so that you can you know, outsource some of the work, bring in uh, subcontractors, temporary employees, if you will, um, to get some of my work done. Do I have that flexibility? Do I have that kind of an environmental resource to do that? Or have you capped my headcount and given me no money if my work volume increases and exceeds the capacity that I have with my staff, you know, what what am I just gonna be late with everything or are there some mechanism in place for me to get the resources that I need in order to get the job done? Uh, do I need, you know, uh, do I need to run out space for my subcontractor teams that I'm bringing in to get this extra volume of work uh, attended to? Uh, so there's those kinds of things. And the final thing under environment in my model are, is the culture and consequences. And one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rumler, and I don't think he ever really said it this way, this is just my takeaway from all of that, is that um, culture is the consequence system. What is accepted, tolerated, what is not accepted and not tolerated um, affects the culture. And that's a top-down thing here, but um, managers need to, and, and while that's top-down, we all who have been in organ, big organizations know that one department of the next, one manager to the next operates and establishes a different culture. Some managers don't let you come in late 15 minutes every day and not say anything, and the rest of the team grumbles about that. Other managers step out to that and stop that. Uh, and they may even then kick in a progressive discipline set of policies and procedures because Guy is showing up late and that's causing a disruption to everybody else's work as they wait for Guy to show up so he can contribute uh, rather than show up late all the time and then take exception to what was done in his absence and force everybody to do all the rework, you know, things like that. So these areas of performance are more typically the responsibilities of middle management and sometimes first level supervisors. So if you think about my model, it could have been arranged in these tiers differently, but at the top tier, that's the executives and middle managers. The bottom tier are the middle managers and sometimes the first level supervisors, and that middle tier is the first level supervisor. But I thought, you know, the core work of sales versus the core work of finance versus the core work of engineering should go into the center of the model. So, you know, uh, ad adopt what you can and adapt with the rest. Um, so the, the these this and the fourth box in this model, I shouldn't forget this one here. Uh, this became very apparent to Ray Karen and I as we were uh, crafting, forming this model back in the early 90s was that there's always this thing called, you know, special assignments or other duties as assigned or, you know, it's working with uh, uh, charitable groups or, you know, being uh, a member of your local uh, fraternal organizations in the community, uh, uh, helping with uh, um, f uh, blood uh, drives and you know those kinds of things here those aren't necessarily core to the work but it may be an expectation of management and whenever I have done uh, this kind of management work before we created this model those things always came out and since we created this model and I've used it on this half dozen projects um, it has always borne fruit there's always something there that managers are expected to do that are, seem to be, you know, kind of a side thing. Besides, you know, working in your department and doing all that kind of stuff, here's some additional collateral duties that we expect you to do. Now, I wrote a, a, a book. I've got some resources on this. I've got, you know, dozens and dozens of blog posts on this. Um, and in 2004, I wrote a book, Management Areas of Performance. And uh, one of my former colleagues in the business with Ray and Karen was a guy named Joe Saner, and Joe Saner was a Baldridge examiner and very big in the whole quality movement, TQM, total quality management movement and all of that. And he was on our staff for a while. And I asked him if he would review this book before I released it, and he reviewed it and he wrote me a 
fabulous forward to the book and talked about how this book aligned with the Baldridge Award criteria and how the, the models and frameworks that they used in the Baldridge Award kind of aligned with this model and I didn't necessarily know, know that. And I somehow, uh, when I moved back in 2004 after I'd written this book and gotten that quote from him, in my move I somehow lost that. And Joe, meanwhile, had changed jobs at one of the big uh, pharmaceutical uh, healthcare supplier companies, I won't name it. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't until he left that organization and somebody in the IT organization said, hey, Joe, we found these files on the company internet and they're yours. Do you want them? And so he found that and he sent me the forward because I had asked him to look for it because I couldn't find it. And he had told me that he had lost it, but then he eventually found it in 2007. And so I finished off the book in 2007 and released it. I, it went immediately to uh, uh, tape, you know, VHS, uh, DVD. Um, I released it as a free PDF from that moment on. I didn't even bother to try to make it a Kindle or a paperback or anything like that. So it is available as a free PDF on my website and you can look under the resource tab and you'll be able to find the free books section in which there are several and this is but one of them. Um, then in 2000, and I did that in 2007 because I was also making some of my other books uh, available as free PDFs and I was trying to encourage myself, push myself to reconfigure and update those books. So the Quality Roadmap book from 94, my Lean ISD book from 99, my Training and Development Systems View book from 2001, this book from either 2004 or 2007, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, also, Ray Svensson and I co-wrote a book on uh, employee uh, performance-based qualification and certification systems. Uh, we had done a bunch of work developing performance tests as part of uh, uh, compensation systems for some of our clients and we had some interesting projects up in Prudhoe Bay in, in 87 and then on the Alaska pipeline in 94 when our client from Prudhoe Bay moved to the pipeline uh, and he took that notion with him and so we built a whole bunch of performance tests as part of that uh, effort and so we wrote a book on that. But anyway, so I took a whole bunch of those books in 2011 and reconfigured them into my six pack and I'd like to share with people that I told Bob Mager that I have a six pack too and he said good luck with that. He's a very nice guy. Anyway, so I updated uh, this Management Areas of Performance and I changed the name of the book to Developing Your Management Areas of Performance Competence. Performance competence is a key concept for me. It's where people have the uh, their they have the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. And so, what I wanted to do with this new version of the book, because it is you know probably 60, 70 percent the same with some differences, and and it was refreshed, but. Uh, I wanted this to be a book for each individual manager to use for themselves or for an organization to use with all of their managers is to figure out using this framework what are the outputs and tasks and how are people in doing this and if we were to prioritize their development what things would we have them work on first, second, third, 14th, 27th, and 43, third. Um, and so I wanted to create a framework and a tool, and that's what this book is. So while this book is available as either a Kindle or a paperback, to me the paperback version makes more sense because you would want to write on the blank pages and spaces that I left in the book. And with a Kindle, of course, you can't do that, but you can take you can handle that other ways. And those of you who are technically astute can figure out how to do all of that. But anyway, that's the nature of this 2011 version of this concept of the management areas of performance. Um, and managers could also use this to look at their individual contributors, um, but it's really focused on the managerial responsibilities of all these boxes in the three tiers. And the only time it, it really gets into the individual processes of an organization that the individual contributors perform within, or the, when they're supporting other organizational entities and you've got to do the planning and monitoring and, and uh, troubleshooting, assigning, um, 
work, then, you know, that's, that's where that crosses over, but it doesn't really help you get into the specific uh, analysis processes or analyzing the processes of the individual contributors and what they're doing. Um, that is a, a, another book entirely. Anyway, so that brings us to a close here. Again, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based uh, uh, Performance Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. And I've subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but that's not for my insomnia, it's for yours. And of course, I'm just kidding. Cheers. <laughs>